Please take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. Luke, chapter 4. And we'll continue to study this morning of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his ministry, his ministry to the desperate, which really is all of us at some point or another in our life. But I'd like for you to notice these that he ministered to in Luke, chapter 4. If you are physically able, please stand for the reading of the Word of God this morning. We'll start with verse 31 of Luke chapter 4. It is following along in your own Bibles, or please listen to me as I read. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting... All those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place. And the people sought him and came to him. And would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Fathers, we study this passage today. I pray that we would see your love and how you are the one who came to minister to the desperate. And Lord, that's really all of us at some time or another, and probably some of us, especially this day. So may we turn to you and follow your word to where we say, as these people did when they saw your work through the word of God, what a word this is. And thank you that we have this word, your word, right here today that we study together. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Just months before America entered World War II, a young Marine from Ohio by the name of Walter Ossipoff boarded a DC-2 transport plane. He and several other Marines took off on a routine parachute jumping exercise as pilot Harry Johnson headed aloft into the beautiful blue San Diego sky. Nine men jumped from that plane then disaster struck. Ossipoff was standing near the jump door when his ripcord caught on something and deployed. His chute flew open and he shot from the plane like a rocket hitting the side of the aircraft. The impact broke two of his ribs and fractured three vertebrae. As Ossipoff plunged toward the ground, he was yanked to a stop then jerked backward. His parachute had wrapped around the plane's wheel, and the hapless Marine found himself dangling 15 feet below the plane's tail. He was literally, literally hanging by a thread. And this is an actual picture of that event. Well, it got worse. The chute's chest strap and one leg harness had broken. 
So Ossipov was dangling in midair, upside down, suspended by a single strap which had slipped down to his ankle. His weight put tremendous pressure on the plane, and pilot Johnson struggled to keep from nosediving. Furthermore, pilot Johnson had no radio contact, and the other men in the plane could not reach their buddy. The dangling Marine, injured and terrified, kept his eyes squeezed shut, rushing against, or against the rushing wind. Blood dripped from his helmet. He was in a desperate, desperate situation. I will tell you the end of the story later. <laughs> but for now, I'd like you just to think of how helpless and how desperate Walter Ossipoff felt. And I share all of that with you because I believe that describes the emotion and feeling of the people that Jesus ministered to here in Luke chapter 4. These people were in desperate situations. And I'd like to study with you their situations because we may find ourselves described by the desperate situations that these people faced. These people in Luke chapter 4 were desperate because of three reasons. And the first is this. Some of these people were afflicted by Satan's demons. It's found in verses 31 through 39. Now, this was true for the man in the synagogue in Capernaum in verses 31 through 34. And there were also many who came to Jesus, and that's found in verse 36, who were demon-possessed. They needed the power of Christ. They needed to be delivered. They were afflicted by Satan's demons. And I'd like you to notice with me three truths about these demons. First of all, they were those who recognized Jesus' deity. Now, before we look at what was said, we need to understand something about demons. Demons are fallen angels who sinned when they joined Satan in his rebellion against God that is described in Isaiah chapter 14. The demons knew every member of the Trinity of the Godhead. And here, even though they had not seen Jesus in human form, they instantly recognized him as the second person of the Godhead. They knew they were standing before God in the flesh. And as Jesus was preaching there in that synagogue in Capernaum that day, there was a man in that synagogue, in that congregation, possessed by a demon. And suddenly, in the middle of Jesus' teaching, this demon cried out from this man with a loud voice. And he said, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And it also says in verse 41 that later that day, as Jesus was healing many people of diseases and sickness, that he was also casting out demons out of many people. And those demons cried out, and they said, you are the Son of God. And if you look at the end of verse 41, it says that they knew that Jesus was the Christ, the word Christ meaning Messiah, the appointed one of God. Prophesied in the Old Testament that would come and bring the kingdom of God. These demons knew that. And they recognized the deity of Jesus. That was all. They realized their destiny. Please notice a very important question that they ask in verse 34. Have you come to destroy us? These demons knew that there was coming a time when they would be judged for their sin. Now that could be why in James chapter 2 and verse 19, we read that demons believe and tremble. Now they believe in Christ, not in regards to salvation. They're not saved. But they believe who Jesus is the Son of God, God in the flesh. And they know that the time is coming when they will be judged for their rebellion and rejection against God. They know that. They realize their destiny. But they are also those who responded with obedience. 
again, this, this service is going on. This demon says this to Jesus. And Jesus simply says, be still, come out of him. And the demons obeyed immediately. They didn't even hurt the man. They came out because of the power of the word of God. And that's why it's very important for all of us to stop for just a moment as we consider all of this and ask ourselves, are we as smart as these demons? Do we recognize the deity of Jesus Christ? Do we realize our destiny if we are here today and have not trusted Christ as Savior? Do we realize that we're headed towards hell? Do we really know that? Or as Christians, if we are those living in sin, do we realize our destiny? And the break of fellowship between us and God and with us and others, and we could go on and on about it. I mean, do we realize our destiny as they did? And then do we realize how important it is to respond to the Word of God? When the people saw this, I'm trying to imagine this in my mind. I mean, think of a service like this. And, and the preaching of Jesus is interrupted, and this demon talks to him, and Jesus casts him out. The man that was possessed is down there, lying there, but he's okay. Well, <laughs> that would cause quite a reaction and a response, and it did here. The people said, what a word is this? What a word is this? That Jesus, by his very word, cast out those demons. Now, that's the response of the demons. But what's the response of Christians? What should our response be? Now, when we study about demons and Satan, at times it can be rather confusing. At times it seems rather mystifying. How are we to respond to this passage? What application should we make as Christians when we read about all of this? And that's a very important question, and I want to study it with you today in detail. First of all, know that as a Christian, you cannot be possessed. 1 John 4, verse 4 says, He who is in you is greater than he is in the world. Once we are saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes to reside within us. Not Satan, but the Holy Spirit. So we cannot be possessed. But here's something very, very important that we often overlook, maybe don't even know, and that is this. As Christians, know that we can be oppressed. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Satan is trying to destroy you, and he's trying to destroy me. He's seeking who he may devour. Now, he's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere present, but he's trying to do this. He's trying to do this with Christians. 1 Peter 5, verse 8, is in the context of God giving his word to believers. To believers. That's why we're to be sober-minded, serious-minded, watchful, because Satan's trying to destroy us. And then Ephesians 4.27, we read, Give no opportunity to the devil. Now, Ephesians 4 is written to the church at Ephesus. It is written to Christians. And so what we realize here is that we can give opportunity. God is clear about that. The word opportunity means that we can... Give a standing to Satan in our life. Opportunity for him to oppress us, to tempt us, to bother us, whatever word you want to use, afflict us as Christians. That can happen. But we need to know something else. Know that we can have victory over Satan and his demons. Now I'm talking to believers. God's talking to us. And there are three steps here. The first is this. Submit to God. Resist Satan, and he will flee from you. That's James 4, 7. Look at it again. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The word submit here means to line up under. The word was used as soldiers under the authority of their commander. And James uses this word to describe a willing, conscious submission to God's authority in our life, specifically to each one of us. Do we recognize that he is the sovereign king? We sang about that this morning. And what does that mean we're to do? We come under his authority. We submit to him. A truly humble Christian is one who will give his allegiance to God 
And he proves that and does that by obeying God's commands in his word and following the leadership that is stated in the word of God. The phrase, resist the devil, and he will flee from you, is the flip side of the first command. The word resist literally means take your stand against Satan. Take your stand against him by submitting to God, doing what God says. And so this verse tells us many things, but one application is this. All people are either under the lordship of Christ or under the lordship of Satan. You say, well, who said that? Jesus said that. Jesus said, either your father is God or your father is Satan. And so it's stated here in different words right here in this verse. There is no middle ground. Those who transfer their allegiance to, or I should say from Satan to God, will find that Satan will flee from them. So God's very clear about it. As believers, we need to continually, daily submit ourselves to the Lord and resist the devil by doing that, and he will flee from us. Second step is this. Resist Satan's temptations by quoting the word of God. I have down here Luke 4, 1 to 13. This is the passage that Pastor John preached from two weeks ago. Right before Jesus began his public ministry, we read that after he was baptized, he went out into the wilderness, the Spirit drove him out there, and he was tempted by Satan there in the wilderness. What did Jesus do? Three times he quoted Scripture, all from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Jesus quoted the Word of God. That's why it's so important that we memorize the Word of God, that we have God's Word in our life. That, brethren, when you and I are tempted just by quoting the word of God, we can have victory over temptation. Jesus gives us that very example. And then the third step is, is this. Deny Satan opportunity by living the word of God. Living the word of God. Now, now this is in the passage, Ephesians 4, 17 through 32. It's right in the middle of this passage where God says, neither give opportunity to the devil. It, seems, it almost seems like it's out of place. Because in this passage, he's telling us how to live the Christian life. A key word is in the context of this passage is the word walk. The word walk means to live. You and I are to live differently when we know Jesus Christ as Savior. We're not going to live perfectly until we get to heaven, but... When we know Christ as Savior, we will live differently. Our life will be different. And God is emphasizing here a number of ways in which it will be different. And he's very specific here about changes that we should make. And if we don't, if we're not living in these ways, again, we are giving Satan opportunity. We live in these ways, and we're not giving him opportunity. What are them? And, or what are they? Uh, I have summarized them in, in several very short statements. Verse 25, tell the truth. Stop lying. Tell the truth, stop lying. Verse 26, confess anger quickly. Verse 27, give to others. Don't steal. Verse 29, let your words edify other people. Don't destroy them. Verse 30, don't grieve God with disobedience. Verse 31 through 32. Love people and forgive people. Love people and forgive people. Love people and forgive people. Hey, can we memorize that? Everybody look me in the eye and let's say it together. Love people and forgive people. We can do better. Love people and forgive people. You say, really? Read the two verses. He even goes into more specifics there. Be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ has forgiven us. Brethren, when we, are, when we are overwhelmed and overcome and controlled by the love of Jesus Christ, we will love people and we will forgive people. So as Christians, we can be afflicted, oppressed by Satan. We can give him opportunity in our life, but praise God through God's word as we obey it, as we quote it, as we live it, Satan will flee from us and we will have victory. And you know what I say in understanding all that? What a word this is. What a word this is. The Bible, the word of God, living and powerful. What a word. Well, 
There's a second way in which many of these people were afflicted, and that was by sickness and disease. And because of that, they were desperate. Jesus goes to Peter's house, and Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a great fever. And they come to Jesus and they ask for help. And Jesus stood over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. Again, through his word, she was healed. Now, God does not promise physical healing for everyone. But he does promise his work and his help for everyone when we do have sickness or when we do have disease. Right here he did it to show the power of his word. And the encouragement and comfort that we can have when we are sick, when we have some disease is that God still ministers through the power of his word. If he chooses to be glorified in your life and mine by helping us when we are sick, we need to submit to that, turn to him, and allow him to do it. At times he heals. If he doesn't heal, he will help. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 through verse 10 are words which... God has given the choice as truth. Paul had a physical problem. And notice what he does, starting in verse 8. Paul says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that, he should, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's the grace of God. And that was with Paul when he had this physical problem. So God's word will bring healing or help, whatever his will is, when going through sickness and disease. But there's a third reason why many of these people, in fact, on this third reason, all of them were desperate. And that is because... They were afflicted with spiritual death. Verses 42 through 44. The people here in Luke chapter 4 wanted Jesus to stay with them. And you can't blame them, can you? <laughs> I mean, everybody who was sick came to him and Jesus healed every one of them, it says. Demons were cast out of people. I'd want him to stay in my synagogue in my town as well. And they go out as a great crowd and try and bring him back and make him stay. But Jesus said... That he must go to other cities and preach the kingdom of God because that is why he had been sent. Jesus knew that every person on earth was under the sentence of death because of their personal sin. And that's still the case today. Romans 3.23 says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10 says there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. We all know what wages are. It's what we earn. And what we earn because of our sin is death, spiritual death. Death means separation, separation from God in a place called hell, which, by the way, was created by God for Satan and his demons, but everybody who rejects Christ as Savior will end up there if they don't trust him before they physically die. And Jesus, praise God, came to this world on a mission for you and for me who are facing spiritual death. Just like all the people that day when he ministered at that time. He came to pay the penalty of our sin, which he did when he died on the cross. There he took our punishment. He took our pain. He took our place. He paid our penalty. And he died for us. And he was buried. And three days later, praise God, he rose again from the dead. And today he is the living, risen Savior. But this is what he was preaching this is why he came. Yes, he helped people who were sick. Yes, he cast out demons by the power of his word. But he needed to give that word to other places. And so he went to other cities. Let me give you another passage that shares this. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14, 15, it says, When Jesus began preaching, he came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now there's one word here that I've somehow always missed or overlooked about the importance of this word in that verse. And that is the word ye, Y-E. What does that mean? It means you. 
Now, here's how this occurred. Jesus is preaching to a, a crowd of people. And he tells them that he came to give the gospel. This is why he did it. And as he looks at this crowd, I can just imagine, he started from one direction and looks at all these people. And he says this, you, you, repent and believe the gospel. It was a personal word for all of them and it's God's personal word for you and me. You, repent and believe the gospel of the kingdom of God. Again, what a word. What a word God gives. And it's so important that we understand that the answer to spiritual death is spiritual life, and it comes, first of all, by the word of God. God's word brings salvation. 1 Peter 1, 23. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. The living word of God. The abiding word of God. There will always be. That is how we get saved. That's how we know the gospel, that Jesus died for us and rose again. But that's not where it stops. That's where it starts for believers. God's word brings sanctification or spiritual growth. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is breathed out by God. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. It's talking about our spiritual growth. And I read this and I think, and I say to you again, what those people in Capernaum said when they saw the work of God through his word, they said, what a word this is. What a word this is. It brings about salvation and it brings about spiritual growth. So the word of God brings victory over Satan and demons. The word of God brings healing or help with sickness and disease. The word of God tells us how we can have spiritual life instead of spiritual death and then grow spiritually. And again, I say, what a word this is. What a word this is. And that brings us back to our Marine. Sorry to leave you dangling. <laughs> <laughs> If you remember, he is in a desperate, desperate situation. Walter Ossipoff was hanging by his ankle, pulled behind a plane by the cords of his parachute, which were entangled in the plane's wheels. The pilot, Harold Johnson, was running out of fuel, and he knew that an emergency landing would kill Walter. So pilot, Harold Johnson descended to about 300 feet above the ground and started circling the air base. Many people who saw the plane thought it was towing some piece of equipment. But one pilot on the ground, Lieutenant Bill Lowry, glanced up and instantly knew what was happening. Spotting a nearby Marine by the name of John McCants, Lowry shouted, there's a man hanging on that line. And the two men jumped into an, and that's what this is, an SOC-1, a two-seat open cockpit plane, and they took off without even knowing if the aircraft had fuel. Suddenly, everyone on the ground realized the nature of the emergency. A huge crowd gathered. Every eye was transfixed, transfixed. There were no radios on the planes, but Lowry hand signaled Pilot Johnson to head out on the, over the Pacific. And the two planes rose to an altitude of 3,000 feet. The SOC-1 maneuvered beneath the larger plane and McCants the Marine sitting in the back seat of the SOC-1, stood up right in the rear cockpit seat and lunged for Ossipov. Grabbing him by the waist, he pulled him across the tiny seat, but Ossipov was still attached to the harness. 
Now both planes and all the Marines were in mortal danger. Somehow, in fact, the writer of this incident where I read this story, the writer said, by the grace of God, Lowry inched his plane closer and closer to the DC-2 and actually bumped it. But in the process, the propeller sliced through the remaining cords of Ossipov's parachute and freed him. After flying through the air for more than half an hour, <laughs> dangling on a parachute line upside down, Ossipov was free, but not yet safe. Now the cut parachute cord became entangled in the SOC-1's rudder, and Lowry struggled to maintain control of the plane. But he did, and when he landed, the large crowd roared and shouted because of the rescue they had just witnessed. They had just witnessed what was later called one of the most brilliant and daring rescues in naval history. And as far as hapless Marine Walter Ossipoff, he spent six months in the hospital. As soon as he recovered, he went back to work, parachuting out of airplanes. <laughs> How did the writer of this story describe this incident? The grace of God. The grace of God. We read in this passage today, the ministry of Jesus to the desperate. Through the spoken word of God, people were delivered from Satan and demons. Through the spoken word of God, people were healed or helped when they were sick or diseased. Through the spoken word of God, people were taken from the sentence of death to that of spiritual life. And so if there are three phrases I'd like you to remember, and especially with us in regards to Christians who can give Satan opportunity in our lives, we need to be those who submit to God, resist Satan by obeying the word of God. We need to be those who resist Satan's temptation by quoting the word of God. And then we need to be those who resist Satan and the opportunity we give him in our life when we don't live the Word of God, we need to do the opposite. Live the Word of God, that it's our practice in our life. Obey, quote, and live the Word of God. And we will experience what the people in Capernaum did. That people in desperation were delivered by the power of Jesus Christ through His Word. And I say once again what they did. What a word this is. What a word this is. It'll help any of us, all of us, who are in desperate situations today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to this earth, for me and everybody in this place, everybody in the world. I thank you that you died in our place. You were buried, you rose again. Thank you. And I thank you, God, for this passage in Luke 4. That as you preached, you ministered to the individual, you do so today. I pray you do so here. And that God, through your word, you ministered to those who are in desperate situations. Lord, you're the only one who knows the heart of every person in this place, and I thank you that you do. And I have no doubt, I know many are in desperate need of your work and power and grace and love and mercy and forgiveness. We could go on and on. We need you. We're turning to you. Now pray, God, that if you're touching the heart of any person in this place today as we close this service, that they will turn to you. And remember that you're the one who looked at everyone personally and said, repent, believe the gospel. You look to everyone and say, when distressed, come to me. My burden is light. You have said that. Oh, God. Work now, I pray, in this invitation time, in the heart of any, any and every individual. And Lord, if you're speaking to us, may we respond today. 
I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like for all of you to stand, please. Everyone standing. I'd like for you to bow your head, close your eyes.